Well, sexually inactive, two words you wouldn't think would describe a lot of people in their early 20s. But a new study out today says millennials and those even younger than millennials are skipping sex as early adults, way more than in generations in the not too distant past. Numerous studies have shown that younger generations are having less sex than previous generations. But why is this? According to an article in Psychology Today, there are numerous reasons, some of which include references to technology such as dating apps and porn. But according to sex neuroscientist Dr. Nan Wise, there is a larger issue at play here. Hi, I'm Sam Breakgear and welcome to Brains Bite Back. Your weekly podcast examining all things to do with psychology, technology and our society. Dr. Wise, who is also an experienced sex therapist and author of the book, Why Good Sex Matters, joins us on the show to discuss why she believes that our reward systems have been hijacked by our phones, impacting our mental health and our sex lives. In this episode, we discuss how social media is engineered to pull us in and capture our attention. Why Dr. Wise refers to dopamine as the slutty neurotransmitter in her behavioral neuroscience classes and how to self-assess if your relationship with your phone is healthy. Dr. Wise also explains how technology impacts our seven core emotional functions and why she believes the Netflix movie, The Social Dilemma, is important for everyone to watch. Take a listen and remember, if you like this show and you wanna hear more episodes, subscribe on your favorite podcasting platforms, leave us a review on iTunes and follow us on YouTube. And if you're feeling sociable, reach out to us on Twitter at, at The Sociable because we would love to hear from you and what you thought of this episode and request for topics of future episodes. So let's get on with the show. If I Google you and nothing comes up, do you even exist? Well, maybe in the eyes of an existentialist like Descartes, but his digital footprint is still bigger than yours. If you're looking to maximize your business's online visibility, our sponsor Publicize can help. Publicize is a digital communication agency that has helped businesses like yours gain exposure in major online publications for the past decade, increasing your digital share of voice and boosting your SEO efforts. And for a limited time only, exclusive to Brains Bite Back listeners, you can receive an SEO assessment as part of your package for any tier of service at no extra charge with this special promotion. To find out more, visit publicize.co slash BBB. Nan, can you tell our listeners who you are and a little bit about the work that you do? Sure. I'm a sex therapist. I'm a sex neuroscientist. I'm a relationship expert, and I'm also a professor. So I do a lot of work with people, helping them learn how to regulate and work with their wired in emotions. I think today's topic is kind of interesting because it's because it's such a broad perspective how like technology impacts our psychology and the things that we're going to discuss today. So I'm yeah I'm I'm super excited to get started. Um, I suppose the first thing to kick it off with is that you mentioned as a society we're experiencing an ongoing and worsening sexual recession that is part due to how our core emotional systems get hijacked by how we use technology. Can you explain why you believe this and what you believe to be the issue here? Well, it's not my belief per se. When we look at studies that have been done, it's showing worldwide, pretty much in all developed countries, the rates of people having sex have been steadily decreasing uh, since about 2000. So there was a, a really a bunch of good studies and this is actually more of a problem for the younger people, believe it or not, like Gen Z and the millennials are just not getting laid as much. So if we look at the statistics, about 28% of men in the age group of Gen Z reported not having sex in the year 2018, compared to about 18% of women who weren't having sex. I wonder so, what that'll be like for 2020. I'm, I'm actually quite worried, uh, and part of what, what my work is, is we, sex is like the canary in the coal mine, Sam, because if we can't get pleasure, if we're not having sex, we, there's something going on. Sex is a window into a relationship with pleasure in general, and also how our emotional brains are working. 
so I noticed as a clinician, I'm a, a therapist too. I've been a therapist for like 30 years. So it's been a long time. I went back to grad school when I was 50 to do the PhD. So I've been seeing that when people show up with mood disorders and anxiety, and we have an explosion of that now, our mental health has gone downhill. And particularly since about 2010, which is about the time that pretty much everybody started using smartphones, which is making us kind of dumb and really anxious. But when people come in when they have mood disorders or anxiety, their sex lives are suffering. And when people come for treatment of sexual issues, when I dive a little bit in, their mood, their moods are off, their ability to regulate their moods. So what I'm passionate about and what is not being discussed, there's like it's going to be a lag in science. There's usually like a, a lag in when, until paradigm shift. We have core emotions that are wired in by evolution that are basically emotional instincts that move us towards meeting our needs for thrival and survival, mostly survival and hopefully thrival, and move away from things that are dangerous or, or bad for us. So there's become, and, psych, and psychology doesn't really look at this, even though we've had a lot of experimental evidence for the, the, the circuits that you can stimulate with electricity, they're defensive systems, and then there are affiliative systems. So psychology kind of focuses all on cognition, thoughts and beliefs, and then more, shall we say, um, thought infused emotions so that really we're not able to, you know, you know what you should do, right, Sam? You should, all of us, should, we should exercise more. We should regulate better. At the top of our minds, we're smart, but we can't sort of turn around when these core emotions are triggered. And that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing people who are very, very triggered. And it's usually triggered not in a good way. It's defenses, fear, rage, you name it. So I'm worried for the mental health. Sex is important, but it's the window into the relationship with our, how our brains are working. So we're really experiencing an, an absolute epidemic of anhedonia, which is the word for the inability to experience pleasure. I did want to ask you, you mentioned about smartphones and about how the introduction of smartphones almost correlates with these mood disorders and these, these symptoms of uh, depression or anxiety. Do you think that smartphones are the cause of this or what do you think is the, the, the real reason or the root cause behind this? Well, I think it's two major factors. It's how we're using our smartphones. I don't think we can blame the technology per se. Mm. If you, it's, they call us users. So like drug users of the smartphones. What's happening is that people are spending way too much time on the device and not noticing that there are people in the room. So it's hijacking our concentration in terms of where we're putting our attention. So that's, that's actually a, something that would exist even if there wasn't sort of negative stuff that, we're going, that was going on with social media and how the engineers who design these programs, these algorithms, these learning programs, it's machine learning, that pull us in so that we get, they're engineering it when we're using things like social media to pull us in so we spend more and more on time on the computer, engaging in the computer, all of this stuff. And it's basically hijacking our emotional brains. So the technology is advanced tremendously, but the wiring of our brains has not, and hopefully won't because the brain is wired in a way where, for example, dopamine, which is the, I call it the slutty neurotransmitter when I teach behavioral neuroscience, because sex, drugs, rock and roll, <laughs> anything that gets us like woohoo is because there's these little like hits of dopamine that are happening. And unfortunately, what that does, it sort of corrupts the learn that actually that's a learning signal. Dopamine is supposed to fire 
in a way that gives us information like reinforcement. Something is good for us, something is not good for us. What happens is it makes the dopamine no longer functional. And that flattens out the dopamine, which makes people's mood really bad. And then they're going back for these little hits. And dopamine is more about wanting, craving. It's not satisfying. True satisfaction is mediated in the brain through what's called the care system, which is powered by opioids or natural occurring opiates that give us the feeling of well-being. And what I explain in the book is that these core systems, if they're not balanced, we're not going to be able to engage in life in ways that are going to be productive for us. So the seeking system is being hijacked and we're, be, we're it's addiction. It's become an addictive process for many people in a way that not only harms their sex lives, the le that's the least of it. If you look at the explosion of self-harming behavior in young women and young girls, if you look at the rates of suicidality on college campuses, depression and anxiety now have become probably the number one health concern for many, many people if you, if you put COVID, which is right now, aside. So we're in trouble and we really need to re-examine our relationship with technology. The people who designed these things didn't do it to create these problems for us. There was a lot of really good intention. And there's a lot of ways that these programs have connected us across the world. But what's happened is it's become all about profit and all about making it more and more addictive. So it's gotten away from being healthy into something that's very harmful. Yeah. I follow a number of like motivational kind of channels or like self-improvement kind of channels on YouTube. And one thing that they keep putting in front of me is um, like dopamine detox kind of videos. And it's essentially like people saying that if you detox yourself from technology or you step away from technology, you perhaps use your phone like once a day or you don't use certain technology, then you essentially train your brain to, to normalize to like what is supposed to be normal for us rather than the constant hits of technology and dopamine that you, you mentioned. And uh, I'm curious to give it a try. Of course, there are certain issues in the sense of we've now relied on technology so much that it's become essential for work. So it's kind of difficult to find a healthy relationship with technology when we're constantly talking to friends, family, needing it for work, and especially now during COVID when we're all isolated and pretty much our phones and screens are the, one of the few ways that we can actually uh, still communicate with everyone. But I'd love to know, in your opinion, what would it take to have a healthy relationship with technology? And how, when should someone really be concerned about their use of technology? I think we need to educate ourselves and each other and go on like, for example, the website, Humane Technology, they have a lot of wonderful guidance about how we can reshape our relationship with technology. And I also say that if we understand how the brain mind works, which is really what I try to explain to people, if you understand that getting those little hits of dopamine, like getting that seeking system, is actually going to harm you and make your mood flat and make you more anxious, the educated consumer is always the best customer. And that includes understanding how the brain mind works, which is really the point of my book. So a lot of what's going on is that most of this stuff, almost all of this happens under the hood of awareness. So what's very interesting, if you watch, for example, The Social Dilemma, did you watch that Netflix documentary? I haven't watched you, it about. Oh my God, it's really, it's by the people for the Center of Humane, for Humane Technology, talking about really the dark side of all of this and how we can become more educated. But what they say, even though these guys wrote the programs and they know how it works, they still get sucked into it. And that's because it is, it's not a conscious thing. Very little of what we are aware of on an everyday basis is like above 
in awareness, very little. Most of stuff goes on in the learning brain, which is largely under the hood. We're not aware a lot of times. We can be consciously aware of triggers, but shaping our behavior, and that's what social media sites do. They shape our behavior. They get us to click. And then they present us with things to buy and things that make cl us click even more. And what they're selling is basically our attention and our behaviors predicting. It's really about predicting what we're going to do. That's what they're selling. So in the uh, social media, the, um, the Social Dilemma uh, Netflix documentary, which I highly recommend. It was educational even for me, somebody who studies a lot of this stuff as a cognitive neuroscientist. We really need to take back technology and make it work for us and, make, and get out of the habits that these uh, programs do, you know, instill in us and like use technology for good. Like I, I tell people, if you're on a Zoom call and you're looking at somebody and you're talking to them, that's a better quality connection than if you're in the room with somebody and you're not paying attention to them. Once again, thank you to our sponsor, Publicize. Visit their website if you want to find out more about their PR for growth packages, their free resources, or even schedule a call. And for a limited time only, exclusive to Brainspike Back listeners, you can receive an SEO assessment as part of your package for any tier of service at no extra charge with this special promotion. To find out more, visit publicize.co slash BBB. I think our relationship with technology is so normalized to always, not necessarily always be on our phone, but it's become so normal to be so attached to your phone. Like, is that healthy? Like, how can we identify whether or not our current relationship with our phone is healthy? If anyone's listening and they're maybe concerned or they're unsure, like what advice would you have for them to kind of like self-assess and self-check and see if you do have a healthy relationship with your technology? Well, I think the place to start, Sam, is to monitor our levels of stress, anxiety, and depression. And if we're pretty stressed out, or depressed, or having a really hard time, one of the things that we can do to really help our moods work better, to help us balance better, is to just assume that we need to scale back mm -hmm. on the time that we spend plugged into the phone. Mm -hmm. There's so much research that shows that it's so deleterious to our emotional well-being that it's sort of like, I would assume if we're struggling, that that's probably something, if we're struggling at all. And if you look at it, there's so many people who are stressed out, uh, that it's a good place to, before we rush into like taking antidepressants or doing anything to address the stress or the anxiety or the depression, just starting simply by, beginning to limit how much time we're spending on our devices. One thing I tell people to do that's majorly important for mood is to make sure they get out in sunlight more. So actually in lockdown and COVID, there were opportunities for people to do better than they usually do by interrupting habits. We spend 90% of time indoors. And when you look at what happens is when we're in light, light sunlight goes directly from the back of the eye to the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is in charge of everything, everything from sleep to eating, to sex, to regulation of our body states, our, our everything. So if we're not getting enough natural sunlight, most people are pretty fat. Most people are pretty stressed out. Most people have trouble sleeping. So I think if we can just unplug ourselves from the phone and go plug into physical activity outside, that's a major, major thing we can do to improve our relationship with ourselves and everybody else. Yeah, I think it's incredible how much sunlight really does affect our mood. And I've noticed that like being from the UK myself, I know what it's like to go a long time without sun and good weather. And now living in Colombia, especially Medellin, which is famous for its incredible weather, it's, it's wonderful weather, uh, I can definitely see that it impacts your mood 
so dramatically like it's in i can't go back i honestly feel that i would love to go back to the uk but i just cannot bring myself to it because i would have to accept the fact that i'm gonna have to take that hit on the 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 lack of sunlight really and that really does have an impact on your mood a huge impact and it actually doesn't even take that much sunlight so if you go outside at least 15 minutes twice a day you're doing a major major good thing for all of the all of your hormones in your body and your brain so and i would also suggest if you go out don't use your phone when you're out if you want to listen to music that's great it's it's not the phone it's how we use it so if we're listening to some good tunes and we're outside the other thing is people need to pay more attention to each other a very short interchange with a stranger during the course of the day where you actually say hi and you interact for like a minute or two can boost your mood and boost the chemicals in your brain. Our brains are like pharmacies that we Mm. can actually influence in a good way. So rather than have the dopamine hijacked with being with these on these devices going down the rabbit hole with all of these applications, we can consciously be better consumers uh, and use the technology. I'm, I'm having a great time connecting with you. I would have never met you. I'd be never, you know, I, after I get done here, I have a session with a woman who's now living in Greece. I worked with her for years in Beirut when she worked in Beirut on, on Zoom or it used to be Skype or whatever it is. That would never happen. And it's free to talk all over the world. There's so many wonderful things that technology has afforded us. We just need to be very conscious of how it's impacting not just as individuals, but society in a way that's becoming where people are getting so polarized. This Being in the States right now is a show. Am I allowed to say show sam yeah don't worry i can always just bleep it <laughs> if we lose. oh I we're mean, not I'm allowed fine. To... i'm well i think we're allowed to swear i don't know i've i've never really sworn before on here i have had some people swear on here but i also like the sound of a bleep like it, for me it just sounds so much yeah. funnier <laughs> it's like a it. hot mess <laughs> it's a hot mess in the states now so if you watch fox news or msnbc which are both very polarized the outrage that people are feeling and what's that doing, Sam? It's inflaming the rage system. Yeah. Can I talk a little bit about those core systems since people don't it. really yeah, know yeah, about yeah. it? So I mentioned there are seven wired in emotions that we share with all mammals and some other animals as well that nature put in because they're for survival. So we have the seeking system that we talked about, which is really about our motivation and our enthusiasm. It feels good, but it doesn't satisfy. These dopamine hits, they feel good, but they don't satisfy. So we have seeking, which is trying to get us into the world to meet our needs, right? And our needs are for safety. So we have the fear system that gets triggered when there's a situation that's potentially uh, dangerous, and that gets us to mobilize And that fear system is important, but when it doesn't work properly and we're walking around in fear all the time, we don't have access to the affiliative ones. And the same thing for rage. Rage is important. Rage can be a very motivating force for us to take a stand for ourselves as people and take a stand to be outraged when we see societal injustice, like what was going on here in the States with what happened with Black Lives Matter. That is useful and important. But when the fear system or the rage system is triggered too much, then we don't have access to the affiliative systems such as care. Care is what makes us feel good. We get a connection. Our brains release all of these beautiful, nutritious, nourishing neuropeptides, predominantly the opioids and also things like the oxytocin that make us feel good. Then we have the play system. The play system, in fact, is so depressed in most adults. 
play is really part of the social joy system. For kids, the play system is how they learn. And what's getting hijacked in kids because they're spending too much time sitting on their butts playing video games or just not relating to each other is they're not getting properly socialized. So they're not learning how to be competitive and cooperating with others, their social skills are lacking, which is probably why a lot of the kids are having trouble getting laid, the, the uh, teenagers and the young adults who are having really social awkwardness and the lack of being able to be comfortable in their bodies around other people. So we covered care, play, and last but not least, lust, the urge to merge. And lust, when you put together, when people have access to play, care, and lust, it makes relationships feel good and be good for us. So, you know, sex is important, but it's really just a window into our ability to enjoy ourselves and each other. And when you look at kids, another reason why they are showing some of these signs of ADHD and all sorts of issues is they don't have rough and tumble play. They're not out there playing with each other like we used to. So we're, we're showing a lot of signs of the core systems being imbalanced into more of the defensive systems where people are either hot tempered or fearful. And it hijacks us. We're not able to make good decisions mm. when we're hijacked in that way. So really, that's the point of my book. I wrote it, and I'm almost sad that it says why good sex matters, because people go, oh, sex. Mm. And they don't get that it's really that actually the capacity to have pleasure is not a luxury. Mm. Pleasure is an important signal to the wired and emotional brain. And hopefully the pleasures that we're experiencing are the kind that actually feel good and are good for us, that lead us to more of connection and more care and more play and being connected with not just the people around us, but caring about other people. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a personal issue. This is a political issue. This is a world issue. We need to make better decisions than yeah. the survival of our planet depends on that yeah and i think uh, you're absolutely right and you are very correct when you said better decisions come from well-informed decisions more uh, or well-informed people rather and i have one last question to you if you could give any piece of advice to parents that are listening on raising children to have a healthy relationship with technology what advice would you give the advice I give parents about helping their kids navigate technology is to first start with yourself, to look at your own relationship with technology and handle that. And then I would go a step further and I'm saying as a parent and a grandparent and a psychotherapist and a person who deeply cares about people, when we can learn to tolerate our feelings, our emotions, and they're expressed in the body, Sam. The core systems are felt viscerally in our body, which is why we need to listen into our bodies. When we can listen into that information and learn from it and tolerate it, we can tolerate other people's feelings. And kids need us to teach them not to rush in to make the feelings go away or to change the channel or plug into a device or you know do something to medicate those feelings but to really give kids tools and boundaries, for example, limiting screen time and really, in, and being mindful about what kids watch on YouTube, forget about it. There's all sorts of, my grandchildren, my little grandchildren, one of them was watching kids opening gifts on YouTube. It was the most bizarro thing. It's very popular. And, it's, yeah, I've, I've heard of that. And it's it insane. was like, I don't get it. You know what it reminds me of the young, the millennials and the Gen Z watching these dating shows <laughs> and not having sex. It's the craving. It's not the satisfaction. So I think as parents, and we can be very mindful of like, first of all, checking out our own habits. And then, for example, going on to websites like humanetech.com 
And there's so many fantastic resources for parents. And I think we should all get involved. We should volunteer. We should be part of these discussion groups. We should care about taking technology back as a source for societal wellness goes beyond the individual. And if you look at how people are doing, they're not doing well. And it's a mm. symptom. You mentioned earlier, it's about how technology is used. It's not necessarily whether it's good or bad. And that's something that is a constantly reoccurring theme here on the show. It's not necessarily good or bad. It's just how it's used. So yeah, definitely. Let's hope people start using it in a, in a better way and start educating themselves more. Um, and I think these sound like really good points. I'm going to check out that show that you mentioned on Netflix, uh, The Social Dilemma, right? Yes, yeah. The Social Dilemma. I, it blew my mind. I was going to say, if people want to check out your book as well or, uh, or other topics related to, to what you're working on or just generally keep up with what you're doing, what's the best way for them to do that? If you go to my website, uh, askdrnan.com, and doctor spelled out with all of the letters, um, I'm constantly writing and offering people tools about, for example, how do you know if you're anxious, what you, know, what you need to know to improve your relationships. So, and I also have uh, a free program to learn how to harness your breath and work with your body and your mind to calm yourself so that you're, when you do that, your emotional systems rebalance. This is, the breath is an incredible tool. And what we use our minds for, I published a paper that showed when women just thought about really pleasant or pleasurable uh, stimulation, it lit up the brain like a Christmas tree. So we need to take back our minds and our attention and put them to things that are enhancing. So pleasure is not a luxury, it's a necessity. I should know I'm a long-term anxiety sufferer. I come from a long line of anxious people. So I've been learning these tools for myself and teaching them to other people for about 30 years now. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you're doing good work. And uh, it was a real pleasure having you on the show today, Nan. Yeah. And people can also schedule a free consult with me by phone anywhere they are by just clicking on my calendar on my website. Awesome. Excellent. Well, there you are. Um, check it out. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining me. It was a pleasure. And this is a great example of how technology can be used for good. Thank you for doing this podcast, this series. Indeed. This is really important. Well, it's my pleasure. We are finished for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And as ever, you can subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your podcast from. You can follow us on YouTube and go to social.co to check out all of our episodes and articles on topics just like this. We hope you join us again soon. And until next time, take care of yourself. <laughs>